So today is President's Day. And one of the many things that pop up, and when I say many things, the thing that pops up the most is besides Facebook battles about which president is the best, which is a ridiculous topic for another time, are these top 10 lists. Although lately, uh, depending on which academic or whoever is producing the list, they do uh, worst 10, and then they use that as an opportunity to say, like, ah, George W. Bush, George H. W., and, and so forth and so forth, which honestly wouldn't bother me too much anyway uh, because any of these presidents besides a select few have operated outside of their constitutional authority. But um, when we have those those top 10 president lists, it's always George Washington's name at the top. Unless you get somebody who's really get just nuts and they put Lincoln. And it's either one of those two, Washington or Lincoln. And let's see. One thing that's, that's been uh, increasing as of late is, is the religious aspect of Washington. How religious was he? What religion did he practice? And so forth. Now, according to Washington biographer Edward Lengel, he was, quote, he was a very moral man. He was a very virtuous man, and he watched carefully everything he did. But he certainly doesn't fit our concept of a Christian evangelical or somebody who reads the Bible every day. And he lived by a particular Christian theology. We can say that he was not an atheist on the one hand, but on the other hand, he was not a devout Christian. But what's the story of him kneeling in the snow at Valley Forge to pray? So according to legal, that was just a story made up by early Washington biographers. Now, if you look at Mount Vernon's website, uh, it has a whole page on Washington and his religious beliefs. And it starts off by saying, when studying the religious beliefs of George Washington, it's a difficult to make absolute concrete conclusions. Depending on the source examined, Washington has been painted in different lights, ranging from a deist to a believing Christian. No matter what precise conclusion is obtained, there are common facts surrounding Washington's relationship with religion. Once again, this is from the Mount Vernon site. Uh, the first one is Washington was a great great grandson of Lawrence Washington, who was an Anglican pastor. Anglican pastor, sorry. Uh, regarding direct church participation, Washington was a devoted member of the Anglican Church. Uh, the third one in B, in regard to personal spirituality, Washington was generally private about his religious life. Washington is reported to have had regular private prayer sessions, and personal prayer was a large part of his life. One well-known report stated that Washington's nephew witnessed him doing personal devotions with an open Bible while kneeling in both the morning and the evening. It is clear that when it comes to religion, Washington was a private man, more so than other aspects of his life. Once again, this is from the Mount Vernon website. Also, it said Washington was said to have refused to take part in active church participation, but there were conflicting reports. One states that Washington did participate in Holy Communion before taking control of the Continental Army, but not afterwards. Washington, however, would often leave church early, leaving Martha Washington behind. Uh, there's also a debate as to whether Washington believed in an afterlife. While it's possible uh, that he did not believe in a doctrinal Christian heaven, it is also possible that he carefully, he was careful about whom he referenced in mentioning a joyful af as afterlife, excuse me. And then notably, Washington did see God as a guiding uh, as guiding the creation of the United States. So what you get when you are talking about uh, Washington and his religious background, this shrouded and mystery type thing, uh, it's it's really very interesting to look at simply because as you know the first and the first of hearts of many, I forget I actually forget the phrase I had it on the tip of my tongue. but he's so revered in the political atmosphere and especially, historically within the uh, the creation of the of the union uh, now there was an article that came out by a man named uh, let's see Ben Emerson there we go sorry about that Ben Emerson it was titled George Washington's conversion to Catholicism and it made some some claims but then there was a retort that came out in 2009 titled did George Washington convert to Catholicism with a question mark and joining us now in the Bear Brief on the Crusade Channel, which is King Size Truth from Radio Size Speakers, is a very special guest, Ryan Grant of Mediatrix Press. Welcome to the program, Ryan. Thank you. Glad to be here. Excellent. Would you uh, like to take a moment to introduce yourself to my audience in case they have not heard you before? 
Indeed, thank you. Um, I am a historian, and I run uh, Mediatrix Press, as you've mentioned, and I know Mike's been running uh, commercials for us, which is a small press based in Idaho. We basically reprint books, and we also print translations, mostly on theological subjects. And uh, it of late, uh, it's been uh, St. Robert Bellarmine in his uh, famous volume, The Controversies, have been doing that piecemeal, uh, the two million words in Latin, working in working that into an English dress. And then uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori, who's the church's moral doctor. You know, so I've been translating his his moral theology for the very first time in English. And uh, apart from you know a few other works here and there, and um, a lot of books that are in the public domain, we reprint. And so, and personally, I'm a historian and I'm a researcher as well as a Latinist. And so I, I do research in various libraries, mostly the Vatican, but also the, at least online anyway, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris and other places, mostly just in areas of historical other things that one day will become a book when I've got things in order. And, and so in other, other matters, uh, you know, pertaining to, to history, especially the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, that's kind of my, my, the period where I'm most alive historically, it's just where I'm more or less into everything. Excellent. Excellent. Um, ironically enough, or coincidentally enough is probably a better way to say it. My mass, my, uh, undergrad was in histor uh, history with a concentration in early colonial settlement. So we do have a little bit, uh, in common on that. Now for this article that you wrote, did George Washington could convert to Catholicism? It is, uh, it seems like it's a, uh, a retort or a rebuttal to this first article by Ben Emerson. Now, where, where did you find that article? How did you come across that first article from Ben? From Ben? Um, I, let's see, <clears throat> um, something might've got mixed up cause I haven't actually written an article on this subject. Oh, okay. <clears throat> uh, you might be thinking of, uh, Marion T. Horvath. Uh, she's the, you might be looking at her articles as that's, uh, by her title and she's the one that looks like she's responding to Emerson. Okay. Um, now do you have, now have you read the, uh, article by, uh, I have, yeah, I have. And so it, it's, uh, it's worth talking about. So where, where does this whole business about George Washington converting to the faith? Cause we don't hear about it in early texts. We don't see it anywhere in any uh, any kind of Catholic books or anything, so, so or even of that time. So well, where did this all come from? And really, the very first written historical account that makes any reference to Washington's actually, you know, a, a claim, may even makes the claim or tries to relate any of the evidence is from 1900. It's the very first time it appears anywhere. So it's about 101 years after the event. So um, American Catholic Historical Researches, uh, volume 1617, uh, they have an article which um, I can't remember if, if Dr. Horvath mentions this in her, her essay, but anyway, the, um, <clears throat> so they have it which says, quote, it has often been the subject of regretful remark among the good people who appreciated the pure and exalted character of Washington, that he seemed to make no mention of religion in his last moments and make no preparation for the step into the awful eternity beyond this life. In this connection, the writer recently came across a curious legend current among the, the note the dated language, by the way, current among the colored people living for the past few generations along the Maryland and Virginia shores of the Potomac adjoining Mount Vernon that George Washington on his deathbed was baptized a Catholic. Quote, Massa George, they say, was a good man, but he done gone back on what he died on when he died. And the story they tell as follows, that the night before Washington died during the fierce storm, his colored body servant came riding down to the bank of the Potomac and be after being ferried across, said he had come in search of a Catholic priest. After some delay, one of the old Jesuit fathers for the mission on the Maryland side was found, taken over to the, to the river to Mount Vernon, where he went at once to Mr. Washington's room and remained there within three hours. When he left, he seemed much gratified and said to those about him that there need be no more apprehension for Mr. Washington as the future of his soul was secure. He was then taken back to the Maryland shore and <clears throat> the old, quote unquote, the old darkies tell with unvarying detail, yet yet the dated language is 1900, yeah. tell with unvarying detail that the, their fathers believe Washington died a Catholic. 
In addition, the Jesuit record says that on the day after the visit to Mount Vernon, the old Jesuit went to the superior of the mission and related the fact of his journey, handed the superior a sealed packet, saying, I am not permitted to detail what has transpired between Mr. Washington and myself in his room at Mount Vernon. But I have written it out carefully here, and after we both have passed away, an occasion requires this can be opened and its contents made public. The superior took the paper and placed it among the records of the mission, where it remained until shortly after the death of the old Jesuit, when it was boxed up, still unopened, with a lot of other papers, and sent to the headquarters of the order in Rome, where it is still supposed to be awaiting the, unfort the, the fortunate chance that will disclose it to the hand of some appreciative investigator who may throw some light on this very curious historical question, unquote. So that's the account in the 1900 record. And so... It, so it's just kind of like at the starting point. So as the, the record kind of develops, they start adding details to it. So then, so then you know, here it just says an unnamed Jesuit priest. And, of course, omitting the fact that there were no Jesuits at this time. That's the other thing, that whoever made this up was unaware of the fact that in those years, uh, even if they were formally Jesuits, the Jesuit order had been suppressed by Pope Clement XIV. So they uh, were not, you know, who had died several years earlier. Anyway, so we're, we're already up to Pius VI. So there's no chance that this is actually, you know, that they're reflecting things correctly. We don't seem to understand how that worked at that time. But as it goes on, then they add on Father Neely. And so for, and as the kind of identify him as the Jesuit, I believe, unless I'm mistaken, that first happened in the 1952 Denver Catholic Art, uh, Register article, which is kind of the main source that everybody uses for this conversion account. So they, you know, more or less give the same story, but then they, they make it Father Neely, right, who was the provost of, of Georgetown. And this actually is a, a useful thing as it helps us identify and debunk it a little bit. Because um, as the president of Georgetown, um, he, he, you know, he had papers, he had secretaries, I mean, an absence like that, you know, would have been noted and recorded for several days, and especially in December. And it's not even certain that Father Neely was even present in December at Georgetown. He may not have been there at all. So the it's it's because uh, at the time um, Bishop Carroll was trying to get him named as a, as a um, uh, what we now call an auxiliary bishop. So that's uh, you know another point that's curious in the legend that doesn't seem to you know it doesn't seem to wash very well. So that very first source I mentioned, the researches from 1900, they conclude their article on it that the alleged visit of the, of the Jesuit father is largely improbable. Nothing in Washington's life gives a basis for the belief in its probability. And I do not believe he became a Catholic. And so that's how they kind of, they kind of conclude looking over some of that, that first evidence. But that's the story as it goes. Excellent, excellent. Uh, this is the Bear Brief on the Crusade Channel, King Size Truth from Radio Size Speakers. I'm talking to my very special guest, Ryan Grant of Mediatrics Press, about um, this idea about George Washington converting to Catholicism as he died. And um, I'd like, if you'd like to join in on this conversation, you can give us a call at 844 527 8723. Now, in the article, uh, the actual Did George Washington Convert to Catholicism? They said that uh, Father Neal was uh, from St. Mary's Mission. Is that in relation? How, where would that be in relation to Georgetown? If that, if that's something you would actually. I uh, don't I'd... know where the historical location of St. Mary's Mission was at that time. It was somewhere <clears throat> near because uh, Georgetown was actually an outgrowth of the old mission. But okay. I don't know exactly where it lay. So it's got, but it's somewhere in that proximate vicinity. But again, too, that that's the other thing. I'm not sure if that's coming from uh, Ben Emerson's article or Dr. Horvath's article is responding to it. But the um, coming from uh, from Horvath's. Okay. The, because, again, because Father Neely was supposed to, at least anyway, according to the, the timeline of his life that you can get from a few places, uh, 19 Catholic Encyclopedia and a few others, he was the um, basically the provost of Georgetown. So he was, you know, would have been, you know, as he was an administrator of a, of a college. It was not in particularly good health. So it's not, you know, it's, it, again, it's one of those things that, that begs the credulity Especially this whole business of, you know, the father has a, which, or whether it's Father Neely or not, has this sealed packet 
which I guess is supposed to have the documents pertaining to the alleged conversion, and those get sent off and uh, never to be heard from again. It seems like it would be easy enough to just go to the Jesuit archives and find it. And the and it's not an impossible place to get into. They're in Rome. They're you know fairly easy to find. The you know I've talked to a few people that have researched in there, and they said I mean granted there's lots of archives from lots of places, but I mean things from America are in you know a certain place, and if that existed, it's discoverable. Okay. So okay. it is someone who works in archives, you know, archiving is one of those problems because when you deal with manuscripts, you never exactly know what you're going to get. Sometimes hmm. um, you'll get a big packet of, of, of things and you'll be looking around and they, 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 they only give the barest in briefs when you're looking through the electronic card indexes and things, especially in the Vatican. Um, but as a, you know, you might be turning, you'll find this, this document. It's amazing. You're like, Oh wow. You know, in fact, I was just uh, reading in some journal that a researcher in Florence just found uh, the arrest warrant that was made for Machiavelli when the, when the Medici came back into power during the in Florence. And it was one of the things that they've been looking for for years. And then he just you know, stumbles on it in this little laundry list of uh, government documents from the time. So, you know, so it's possible. But at the same time, it's also discoverable. And nobody's taken the time to do that yet. So it really remains an argument from silence, especially when you consider Washington's actual documented life. Excellent. Um... Now, let me let me ask you a question, Ryan, in, in your very nuanced opinion. Why do you think that there's such a uh, such a, a, a pile on to to claim Washington's religion? Why? Why are Catholics and, and evangelicals and all these people trying to claim that he was a so and so or he was a so and so? What? What do you think the genesis of that is? Well, it starts right out more or less off the bat. It, it, it kind of so the genesis Let's start with the Protestant side of it, and then we'll kind of, kind of come to the Catholic side of it. So on the Protestant side of it, it starts off rather early. And so what happened is in the 19th century, uh, you had, there was an event where uh, Freemasonry, of which Washington was an adherent and a very devout adherent to that, was coming in a disrepute. Now, amongst the founding fathers, it was the thing. It was considered one of the, the founding blocks of the nation was uh, Freemasonry and enlightenment and like Jefferson, you know, hoped that eventually his style of Unitarianism would be the creed of the country. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, because then everyone would be fully enlightened. Well, what happened was in uh, 27 years or so after his death, in 18, after Washington's death in 1826, there was a, name, a man named William Morgan, and he was a Freemason. And so supposedly, he had revealed Masonic secrets, uh, and I forget the context where he did it, whether it was in a bar or some other place. But anyway, he had um, so, he, so he'd re after revealing these secrets, he was kidnapped away from his wife and family, mur uh, brutally murdered, and then uh, the body was discovered. And of course, they, the the murderers were discovered shortly after. So they and they were put on trial, and then after flipping, you know, their various hand gestures, were let off. Basically, all charges dismissed, and they disappeared. So that brought a uh, especially from, you know, more and more devout Protestants that really did not get Freemasonry under status influence, but understood it was there. This just got everybody, you know, angry. So Freemasonry became kind of like the big red herring. We've got to do something about this. And you actually had anti-Masonic political parties and other things suddenly rise up. And as a result, um, for example, like Andrew Jackson, um, he was a Freemason. There was a major anti-Masonic political candidate that ran against him in 1828. So the uh, you know so this was kind of alive and well. So what happens is that the uh, as this reaction kind of increases, a lot of people are kind of looking back. Uh, Jefferson was a Freemason. In fact, he was initiated in the Lodge of the Grand Orient. Washington was a Freemason. Payne was a Freemason, and a good number of others. We're, we're all the serious Freemasons. And so what do you do with that? So the first thing you got to do is kind of reclaim the legend, kind of rewrite. Um, so it's kind of the first step in the apotheosis of Washington, but as a, you got to remake him as a, as a Christian. And so one of the, the figures that was responsible for that is Mason Locke Weems, who's an Anglican priest or minister, and uh, definitely a uh, kind of the maker of the propaganda of the various the religious idea of the american founders so he writes in this interesting little poem it's about 82 not mistaken swift or maybe a little later swift on angels wings the bright descended will voices more than human warbling through the 
lofty regions, being the great procession towards the gates of heaven. His glorious coming was seen far off, and myriads of mighty angels hastened forth with golden harps to welcome the stranger. High in front of shadows were seen the beauteous forms of Franklin, Warren, Mercer, Scammell, and of him who fell at Quebec with all virtuous patriots, who, on the side of Columbia, toiled over liberty. Oh, Columbia, such the brother band of thy martyred saints, that now poured forth heaven's wide opening gates to meet thy Washington, to meet their beloved chief, who in days of, of his mortality had led their embattled squadrons to the war. Uh, I just lost my place. At sight of him, even these blessed spirits seemed to feel new after and to look more dazzlingly bright. In joyous throngs, they pour around him. They devour him with their eyes of love. They embrace him in transports of tenderness unutterable, while from their roseate cheeks, tears of joy such as angels weep roll down. So, I mean, it's, um, it's Mason Lock Weaves. Oh, no, sorry, I said... Uh, I met 1922 earlier. It was 1918 uh, when this was published. There, the history of the life, death, virtues, and exploits of General George Washington. So that's just one example of many where uh, writers that would try to reinvent Washington as, you know, principally as a Protestant, as someone who is, uh, you know, because he has a lot of virtues that recommend himself in his general moral conduct, but at the same time. He's not a um, he's not a Christian, and that's abundantly clear just looking at the historical record. So the Anglican pastor of Washington's own parish, Reverend uh, James Abercrombie, when asked about Washington's religion, said, "Quote, Sir, Wa Sir Washington was a deist," and that's uh, quoted by Paul Bowler in his, his work George Washington and Religion, which it, it does a really good study. And Bowler is a Christian. So you can, and he's fairly devout evangelical. So you can't come to someone like Bowler and say, "Oh, he has all these communist revisionists trying to, you know, undo the Christianity of our founding fathers." Because unfortunately, Bowler's a Christian and he's just he's a historian and he's just looking at the documentation available, and including you know this particular quote, which is in the Mount Vernon archives. The um, another thing that Bowler brings out is that Washington avoided the name of Christ whenever he could. Right. And so, and likewise, even the word God was somewhat problematic for Washington. So he uses phrases like this, the great author of every public and private good, the almighty being who rules over the universe, the benign parent of the human race, the invisible mm -hmm. hand which conducts the affairs of men, right, et cetera, et cetera. So all these kind of ideas of Washington as, you know, a Christian, um, you know, it's it's related. There's all kinds of um, you know examples where Washington astutely avoided any any um, what is it connections? Any, would... any connections? Any kind of affirmation of Christian creed? And that's another thing that uh, Reverend Abercrombie is very clear about is that Washington um, Washington refused his services before his burial. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, before his death and burial, he didn't want, and even in his burial, wasn't done by his Anglican uh, vicar. He had a Masonic uh, burial done precisely according to the Masonic ritual as it was at that time. So it, he, uh, the Masonic apron that he wore uh, was draped over his coffin, and this is the apron that he'd quote unquote baptized, uh, you know, the, what, the capital, the, when he was laying the capital building. You're referring to the. Um, uh, the actual procession that he led right. in that full Masonic attire right. in 1793. Which was embroidered by Adrienne Lafayette, the wife of General Lafayette. And she uh, who's Washington's fellow Freemason brother at arms. And Lafayette had joined the Lodge of Saint-Jean de Condé in, uh, I think it was 1775, if I'm not mistaken. But in any event, so, so now this apron is present at his funeral, which was conducted by... Uh, and in two other Masons, one was a Presbyterian minister. Um, so it's, uh, <clears throat> now, it's uh, one of those. Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just, um, we're mentioning Freemasonry a lot. I know there's there's probably a lot of people who only see Freemasons as kind of an offshoot or, or a, ver a similar version of like a Knights of Columbus, a bunch of guys who kind of right. get together and, and hang out. If you could, could you actually just give like a brief summary uh, of what Freemasonry is. 
Sure. Uh, Freemasonry, uh, in a sense anyway, is a secret society that was founded out of the remnants of the old guilds, the ones that hadn't been quite suppressed in England. And uh, the, the, this type of association is generally amongst um, English royalists before the English Civil War. So a lot of them in France started similar types of associations where they could meet and not have to worry about uh, Republican spies in England keeping tabs on them, right? And so they had secret oaths, they had um, all the, and that's kind of the, the, the first origins of it, right? And so it's, it's a secret society largely to get together, and then it kind of transforms and grows in different ways, and it transplants over to this country. So prior to the revolution, at least, <coughs> excuse me, a, uh, if the Freemasonic Lodge um, was largely a place where you could meet, and, and British officers were also part of it too, right? And so and supposedly everything was supposed to be secret, and you were supposed to keep it yourself. Is, is, so that's just where that the founding fathers that, that were that favored independence could kind of talk freely without wor without worrying about you know being uh, being caught as everyone's taking all. Various oaths not to reveal anything under very horrible consequences. So, you know, so you can discuss these things without being, you know, killed for trees. At least that's the hope. The this rituals and ceremony that had been developed by Masonry was a, reflected its, which is not explicitly Christian. In fact, for the most part, at least for them, anti Christian. Which is that I know you have a lot of Masons today. Like, oh yeah, we, we're happy to take in Christians, and but your first oaths are to the lodge. And to the supreme being, and so that's one of the things that reflects deism. Now, the, now you have to make distinctions between American Freemasonry and Freemasonry as it develops in the continent, and eventually these two will merge, largely because of the 19th century, the work of um, former Klansman Albert Pike, uh, who reintroduces, you know, the, the founder of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, or at least the popularizer of it. And, then, and I mean, he's the one who kind of brings American Freemasonry into line with that practice of the continent, but and in England. But beside any of that, so it doesn't quite have all the nefarious things that, that conspiracy theories will associate with Freemasonry and or, or conspiracy facts, depending on which one you're talking about. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> some things are and some things aren't. So yeah. the uh, but beside that, um, you know, so at this time, it's still kind of it's the American version is still developing phases. But the, the key to understanding Freemasonry is deism. Okay, and that's one of the main ideas. So deism arises in the 1700s, and it was part of part and parcel of the uh, the, the, the the way the Enlightenment develops in the United States. And so, especially along the universities, a lot of the uh, the elite, for example, they are you know very much into the you know the founding of deism in universities and whatnot. And in fact, for the for, Four of the first five presidents you know, be, began all their uh, studies in university during the very formative years of deism in the 1700s. So deism basically believes that, well, there's a supreme being of sorts, you know, basically like a founding principle, or Aristotle's unmoved mover type of thing. But well, according to Enlightenment ideas, he is someone that um, basically sets, winds the clock that is the universe and watches it all go. So the creator that sets all principles and, you know, physics and science and the way the world works, and then gets back and doesn't, doesn't mess with it. Okay. So that, that's in a nutshell, deism, no Christ, no savior. All of these things are just fun morals that, that if they're only useful in terms of helping men be good and not be bad. And otherwise, you know, they're just, you know, this stuff's just humbug. Like it was said that uh, Washington would read the Bible for whimsy, quote unquote. <laughs> it was the only time he'd ever read it, according to Thomas Lear, who is his secretary uh, when when Washington was president. So deism became kind of the dominant um, creed at the College of William and Mary, which is the alma mater of both Monroe and Jefferson. And Washington was the chancellor there from 1788 until his death. You know, all of this time, well, well, basically, it was known as the Deist College, because right. it, Christianity was merely optional, and Deism was kind of the main thing there. So, and that 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 factors very heavily into American Freemasonry, the um, you know the concept of the supreme being, and you still see that reflected in a lot of Masonic documentation, that is wise, beneficent, and 
you know, but only in as much as he set all the principles in the universe. And so he doesn't get into it and actually do anything. So miracles are, so everyone knows about Jefferson's Bible, right? Say so all the miracles are taken out of it or his life of Christ or whatever it was, whereas you see all, no, no, no uh, miracles in it. There was also something called the Masonic Bible, which is similar. It's got, you know, miraculous stuff stripped out of it. It's made to accord to reason. And that's what Washington takes his oath of office on, not on a Christian Bible. Not yeah. in the King James Bible or uh, the Geneva Bible, which would have been the two Bibles that you might have seen in the United States at that time. Instead, it was on the uh, the Masonic Bible. And so, how do uh, how does Masonic uh, Freemasonry how does that directly clash? Besides, I, you've already mentioned a little bit of it, uh, how it strips away the miracles and things of that nature. It, what other ways does it directly clash with the idea of, of Catholicism? In Catholicism specifically, um, the regenerative nature of baptism in any way, shape, or form, any any ceremony or symbol, okay, any, any kind of devotion to um, even the idea of asking God for assistance is God tinkering with the natural order. So the idea of intercession, redemption, um, in fact, actually, I'll summarize another historian. Um, let's see. Here's the quote I'm looking for. Here we go. So again, Peter Bowler, uh, Paul Bowler, uh, George Washington, and religion. So it will kind of this will kind of help out uh, to see that if to believe in the divinity and resurrection of Christ and His atonement for the sins of man and to participate in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper are requisites for the Christian faith, then Washington, on the evidence which we have, can hardly be considered a Christian except in the most nominal sense possible. He was more of a Unitarian than anything else in his apparent lack of doctrinal convictions, unquote. It's on page 90 to 91 of that work. So, and you kind of see that kind of a reflection of, in, in Freemasonry, the idea of sacraments, the idea of uh, divine authority on earth, the idea of anything, all of this, again, constitutes the deity kind of breaking the order, very order he himself established. And that's purely unreasonable to to an enlightened deist. So you can't possibly have that. So that's one of those, those principal elements in, um, at least in the Freemasonry of that time, that, you know, you couldn't possibly have this type of you know, thought and be an enlightened person. Hmm. So the, yeah, in another example, um, if you see in like, uh, one of the interesting ways that um, people repurpose art, so iconoclasm, okay, and, and iconoclasm, uh, which which we take to be generally just vandalism, uh, the people involved in it generally actually have a sense of what they're trying to do in terms of the art. They're actually trying to repurpose it for, for a new end, to say something new. So if you look at what happens in the French Revolution, and you look at the Church of Saint-Sulpice in Paris, and you can see where uh, Robespierre's directory had uh, it, it spent a lot of money getting sculptors to repurpose a lot of the Christian iconography on Saint Sulpice because they want to make it a temple of reason. Okay. So it, one of the classic images you'll see, especially in the Baroque period, are angels holding a chalice or a cross or things of this sort. So one of the, the places on Saint Sulpice where at one point the, the angel is holding a chalice, which represents faith in uh, religious iconography in the Middle Ages as well as in the Baroque, Baroque artis, artistry. They've replayed, they've completely scraped this chalice off and they've uh, grafted in a torch, which is a massive, it's a Masonic symbol, it's a big Masonic symbol for the light of reason, as opposed to the, the, the darkness of believing in popes and Bibles and things of this sort. And so that's kind of the, the direction that they want to do. So, I mean, it is in a certain sense of vandalism, but it's also a new form of art. So they're now telling you where enlightenment man is going to go. Um, do you know the uh, the story of the uh, Capitol Chapel, where it's uh, it's one of those basic chapels that you would see at like an airport or something like that? It's a it's just a room, but the right. the one piece of uh, stained glass is actually Washington kneeling and with his hands clasped in prayer. So I think I find that very it, it seems like it's very similar to what you're saying. It is. It, well, it's kind of. Um, it, but nature abhors a vacuum. It's natural to have a religion of the state. You see this in classical philosophy in ancient Athens and ancient Greece. You have like a sort of state religion that is, is just broadly speaking, paganism. 
and that's connected with your notion of, of patriotism in the in Latin. That's pietas, which we take to be piety, but it also means basically your veneration for your country. And how do you show that that, that pietas? It's by taking part in the public liturgia. That is the Greek word for the public act, right? When where we get our word liturgy from, and meaning the public worship of the state. That's how we get this. Um, this problem in the third century or in the first century, second, third century Christians who won't worship the state religion, they say, hey, we'll be good citizens. We'll, you know, we pray for the emperor. We, we don't break the laws. Well, yeah, but you don't worship the gods. Well, unless you pinch incense to Zeus, you're not a patriotic Roman. Ah. And and there we are. And that's that's where the, the issue comes in. So a good conservative patriotic Roman is his his reaction is going to put Christians to death. Because they're, they're they're not they're not patriotic. They you know they might as well be communist or something. I don't know. But the um, you know they, or they're even charged with being atheists sometimes, even which is ridiculous. But you know for that reason, so the state naturally needs a religious principle, like as as like Pope Leo the Thirteenth teaches, and and several other popes too in this vein, that the state is a body that requires a spiritual life. It requires a soul. So if you remove religion from the the backdrop the state is going to create it and you know to, to create its own religious sense and you look at the american civic religion which largely is i mean we have our own processions right parades yep. <laughs> we have yeah. you know, about uh, bigger ones the uh you have your patron saints you have your temples right your churches big basilicas mm -hmm. um i mean you look at the the lincoln memorial who's also commemorated today uh, in, in the Feast of Liberty, you know, again, it's secular holidays. The word holiday is just a corruption of the word holy day. And they have, the state has its secular holidays, its secular saints. So you stick, uh, you look at Lincoln. I mean, Lincoln is sitting like Zeus. It is just like the Greek statue of Zeus um, as it's related from antiquity. Sitting up there, Lincoln is now like Zeus, like this divine god of wisdom. And I mean, and, and of course, with Lincoln, calling him a deist would be very generous you know, in terms of his religious convictions. But well, it's the, also uh, interesting that that temple, that that monument itself, is actually called the temple. It, there's the, that inscription is actually used inside, where in some of the writings say within this temple. Um, I don't really, I don't remember the actual wording of it, but the word temple is actually used within the Lincoln Memorial. And I think that's very interesting when you're talking about how there's this. Uh, perversion of the two being brought together. You, you mentioned Pope Leo the Thirteenth, and apparently in that Ben uh, Emerson article, he quotes Pope Leo the Thirteenth praising Washington in one of his encyclicals in January sixth, eighteen ninety three, where he says, "We highly esteem and love exceedingly the young and vigorous American nation, in which we plainly discern latent forces for the advancement alike of civilization and of Christianity." Without morality, the state cannot endure a truth which that illustrates citizens of yours, whom we have just mentioned, the great Washington, with keenness of insight worthy of his genius and statesmanship perceived and proclaimed. Uh, does that does that ring true at all, or does that is that just completely out of left field? Well, part of it is dependent on what he himself received what, with the information that Leo the Thirteenth got. That's that's one. And at this point, you know, the, the only kind of information going out of America is the, the, of this great Christian man. But Washington also did have natural virtues. Mm. And, he, you know, that were, you know, very, very upright, very, very positive. So, you know, in many ways, very moral. So the, um, and the but at the same time, I mean, you can give like a praise to a non-Catholic. Okay. And in, in a very in a uh, very civic sense, actually, you know what we do? Archbishop Carroll's circular letter to the clergy on 29th December 1799. That uh, kind of really lays it out. He says, "Quote: Roman Catholics, in common with our fellow citizens of the United States, have to deplore the irreparable loss our country has sustained by the death of that great man who contributed so essentially to the establishment and preservation of its peace and prosperity." We are, therefore, called upon by every consideration of respect to his memory and gratitude for his services to bear a public testimony of our high sense of his worth when living 
and our sincere sorrow for being deprived of that protection, which the United States derived from his wisdom, his experience, his reputation, and the authority of his name. So it speaks of those wishing to eulogize the president, and he adds, they are advised not to form their discourses on the model of a funeral sermon deduced from a text of scripture, but rather to compose an oration such as might be delivered in an academy. If these discourses shall be delivered in churches where the Holy Sacrament is usually kept, it will be proper to remove it previously with due honor to some decent place. So essentially, you know, it's a, um, it's a tribute being authored by Catholics to a, to a virtuous non-Catholic for goods that they've, you know, um, acquired. And okay. so Leo XIII basically is doing that. He's giving, because he's writing, and you know, because at the same time as he's also, you know, condemning many things that go on in America, he's also praising its good points. And, you know, try, so he's trying to find kind of this balance. How can we make it better? The light of the Catholic faith. But still, we want to, you know, he, so he's not just, you know, coming out with, okay, yeah, we, we hate you because you suck, because you don't have this. <laughs> he, he's being far more nuanced and saying, well, let's take the good where there's good, and there is good here on these points. And therefore, let, let's bring these types of things, you know, let, let's comment on these things. And then, of course, Washington, who the whole world recognizes as having been a great man in a natural sense. So yeah. let's, let's, I mean, as, as it is, we acknowledge uh, various people in history as being great men who were, you know, certainly not Catholic or, or pagans, you know, Arist um, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, Julius Caesar, um, you know, Caesar's got issues, certainly, but anyway, he's always been held as one of the worthies, right? Yeah. Um, even, even Charlemagne, who did become Catholic, you know, the, the church has given veneration for his accomplishments, even though various things he did in his life, you know, can't really be venerated, such as his various affairs and, you know, things of that sort, but. This is the uh, Bear Brief on the Crusade Channel, King Size Truth from Radio Size Speakers. I'm talking to my very special guest today, Ryan Grant, about George Washington's religion and his supposed conversion to Catholicism. If you'd like to join our conversation, give us a call at 844-527-8723. I actually did find the uh, – Just I just want to make clear when I was talking about uh, Lincoln's memorial, the actual inscription says, In this temple – as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the union and the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. So yes, uh, I want to thank Suzanne for, for clearing that up for me. So yeah, there is that, that uh, worship of specific people within the state. And I completely agree that, you know, just because somebody is not a Catholic does not mean that they're totally a terrible person with no redeeming value. It's just, it's very interesting uh, when we point out Washington's virtues because he does have virtues we all look at them and we and we say oh there's there's things here that are if we make sure we look at them historically accurate not the I didn't chop down the cherry tree kind of things the the idea that he he lived more that these virtues lined up with that stoic philosophy and to to praise the the ideas and the virtues but only so far as to not I don't want to say not make them um emulate not making to emulate but where does as a catholic where do we how far do we go in the praise of washington and while recognizing that this is a guy who said who from that article said only 13 months before his death he declared to the grand lodge of maryland quote so far as i'm uh, acquainted with the doctrines and principles of freemasonry i conceive them to be founded in benevolence and to be exercised only for the good of mankind. I cannot, therefore, upon this ground, withdraw from it. So, how do we? How do we? Uh, how do we balance the two? I think principally in. I don't know because part of it comes down to your political view. So, if you're the type of person that thinks the founding of America was good and everything that the founding fathers had done was a wonderful thing. Um, then you have to look, you'll look at it and say, yeah, you know, we should, uh, you know, find some things that we can, you know, support in Washington's character and certainly, you know, his, his valor. And then, you know, in the fight against the British that, that led to the creation of our country is working with various alliances, his temperance and, in other things. So you'll want to celebrate those particular things. And unless you're someone like myself. That uh, it's probably going to offend a good number of your listeners. <laughs> as, right. a monarch, as a monarchist, 
uh, as someone that I don't see the American founding as an unqualified good. And I think there's actually, a, even though I don't think the British Empire is all that great either, but uh, there's a lot of different historical issues and red herrings that I think really have to be gone through. So I look at someone like Washington myself, and again, you know, I could see these particular virtues in terms of his, his temperance and his mildness and other things. But in, in, and I'm happy to give it, you know, pans to someone who has certain things in order. I mean, he's a, at least he's a statesman. He's a true statesman in, in, a, in a real sense, unlike the people that run around today, yeah. <clears throat> you know, the so-called politicians, which are kind of the exact opposite of statesmen. So. It's uh, I guess we'll intersect this with a question you asked before. You know, why would religious people want to try to make Washington into you know one of, one of them, right? And so kind of you know like kind of use that to bring into this question. So, um, so what you should really want to do properly is adhere to your your faith, look at the, what the principles of your faith demand, and say, okay, we can recognize that as good, and we're going to build on that accomplishment and make it better by bringing this into the Catholic faith, right? If you believe in the Catholic faith, you should hope that the entire country should convert and, and become Catholic. That's why you see figures like Archbishop Hughes in New York. He uh, was a fantastic bishop in the 19th century. Uh, really led, like, it was a level of political Catholicism that was unseen in the country before. And, you know, he declared Catholicism should conquer all nations. We shall, you know, it can convert the president, the military, the Congress, you know, by, by word, prayer, and example. Right. And so that's the kind of the, the goal that Catholics should have. And of course, likewise, if someone's a Protestant, they should want if they believe their faith is true, they should want all their fellow countrymen to embrace that and believe that. Right. But in America, there's a curious thing. We don't believe that as if we're you know, good Americans don't want to do that. Good Americans, everyone do what they want, not preach the faith too heavily, especially American Catholics from the very beginning, especially the American the hierarchy kind of had this idea that there's something to be a, an American, which is like a vocation separate unto being a Catholic, and even more important for many of them. So in, in part of it comes from the, the history of being cowed, being a second-class citizen in your own country. You look at the British Empire, the state of Catholicism there, where it was illegal until 1830. Ireland, right, you look at, uh, and of course, where many Irish are coming from, too, that are coming to this country. Although, all the, granted, the first Irish were actually Presbyterians, believe it or not. But <clears throat> the later waves of Irish immigrants or Catholic have lived under a situation where if they, you know, go out in the middle of the night and start walking into the woods where they're going to have a wagon come through with, where it's fake cabinets and everything will be uh, flipped around. It'll be an altar and everyone's going to have mass now. And uh, if you get caught there, you're dead. If you get caught, you will be killed. So you're basically, you can't practice your faith openly. Now you come to a country that's, again, majority Protestant, but a little bit different. And you know, it has kind of a history of allowing certain levels of toleration that go back to the 19th century and certain things with the, with the Baltimores and whatnot. But um, there's still this idea that we kind of, we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to really preach the faith because that's going to get us into trouble. So, oh, look, religious freedom. We're free and everyone's free. So it's like, I'll scratch my back, you'll scratch your back. And we're all free to do what we want. And be, so, But being an American is more important. And that's kind of the way the Constitution sees it, and certainly the way Jefferson saw it, that religion, and Washington's farewell address is the same type of thing. Mm. Religion, so long as it makes men good, is, is preferable. Whatever it might be doesn't matter. So when the state, again, so the state not embracing an actual religion would <clears throat> become the religion itself. And, but the way in which that was manifested was directed by a good number of Protestants. So Catholics for a very long time, even though you have freedom of religion, and there's a lot of examples of just clear anti-Catholicism in, in, in American history. Sometimes it's amusing, uh, like a certain Catholic that was elected to the South Carolina legislature in the 1820s. And they said, well, you can't take your seat until you can agree to the principles of the Christian church. And he said, excellent. What are the principles of the Christian church? And then, because he reckoned, it was kind of like St. Paul sitting there before the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees saying, I'm on trial for the resurrection of the body. <clears throat> now I'll just watch them fight it out. And they did, right? It's a similar thing here. The Presbyterians and the Anglicans and the, all these groups are fighting it out. They're all fighting it out over who's going to be 
where it and what, uh, you know, into what the Congregationalists, you know, they can't agree on anything. So in the end, they finally let him take his seat, you know. <laughs> so they, you get funny things like that, but then you have other examples, like when they burn convents down, because these lurid tales of what must be going on there, why else would women, you know, renounce the world and not get married and come into a convent, except that it's really a convent full of Satan-worshipping lesbians. Oh, and stuff like that gets passed around in pamphlets, and people actually believed it. So they go burn down the convent and find out every last thing was absolutely false. And say, "Oh, sorry about that. Oh well, you're on your own. We're out of here." <laughs> yeah, exactly. no, no recompense ever made. The know nothings, the wigs, right? You know, firebombing Catholic churches. It was, it was a big thing in the Catholic experience. So, um, and I could go on and on with other examples. But anyway, the Catholic school question, you know, things of this sort. So for, for American Catholics, there's kind of this idea, well, I want to be loyal to my country and I want to be patriotic, but we want to show that Catholicism has a place here. Mm. And yeah. so thus you have, uh, you know, what probably my theory on the, the Washington conversion story originates from Jesuits of Georgetown kind of passing this down at some point created this kind of oral tradition, which wound its way into you know the the researches that i mentioned earlier from 1900 and then to the 1952 denver catholic register article which are the only two written sources period historically for this particular narrative the and so people would embrace try to embrace it yeah if we could show that the the guy that is america when you think of america it's washington right if you want to think of anything about american origins more so than Payne or jefferson or anyone else it's washington it, bar none and if he was a catholic we guarantee our place at the table of religion in america <laughs> because that's essentially what people have been trained to settle for right and so that's why it would be desirable to have this whole kind of legend even though from a historical standpoint, there's simply not a shred of evidence for it. And the worst part is that the most irresponsible part of the legend is that Washington's death is extremely well documented. Again, by Tobias Lear, who we mentioned who was Washington's secretary. He basically says he took his own pulse, uh, which is the consummate gesture of our age, that is the consummate enlightenment gesture in his final hours, and he died. We can actually faithfully record Washington's uh, final hours. Yeah, we actually have it in that article. The, uh, the oh, right. article, about ten minutes before he expired, which was between ten and eleven o'clock. He he, bre he breathing became easier. He lay quiet. He withdrew his hand from mine, and he felt his own pulse. I saw his countenance change. I spoke to Doctor Craig, who sat by the fire. He came to the bedside. The general the general's hand fell from his wrist. I took it in mine and put it to my bosom. Doctor Craig put his hand over his eyes and he expired without a struggle or sigh. Right. Which and there's so many people around him. It's not really plausible that a Catholic priest is able to be road across, come on in and nobody take any account of it, write anything down of it. And, and is this the behavior of um, somebody that has just converted, you know, to the Catholic faith? Right. Why would somebody do that? You know, when you're constructing things historically, it's like people are familiar with textbooks and then people are familiar with your, your secondary sources, your type of your books that a historian, some prof or whatever has written that, you know, on some subject that elucidates some subject. Right. And so people will read various books and people will read a book and think you're a historian now all of a sudden because they read the book. Right. Then there's the primary sources. Then there is the historians that do the work that becomes that secondary source literature. And it's sad, sad to say the the future church series source textbook tradition, which I hate with a passion. But anyway, yeah. um, I mean, seriously, we still have textbooks teaching Columbus sailed to prove the world was round. And that was shown to be false over a hundred years ago. And it's still in the darn textbooks. Well, yeah, the problem with textbooks, you, you can get me off on a tirade that for an hour, it's all baked yeah. into wh whoever is purchasing and so forth. Right. I'll give you the last word right here. We got to wrap it up. Okay, so the last word anyway, so, so real history is done by going to these primary sources, by going to the direct sources. So when you go to the direct sources for Washington, you have his diary. And diaries are much more important than memoirs, by the way, because a diary is what you're writing as events are happening and unfolding. Whereas a memoir, you're looking back trying to remember. And I know if I try to remember for like six months ago, I might be confused about what, what had happened. So Washington's diary mentions nothing about Christ, nothing about the Christian religion. The word God appears twice in the whole of his, his diary. 
uh, mm-hmm. for, for years and years and years. His letters are the same way. His, uh, the only thing he's passionate about, principally, is Freemasonry and deism. And he makes this very clear in all of his public addresses. Jefferson um, actually tells a story of some Protestant clergymen that attempted to trap Washington, that att- attempted to get him in on you know, to declare whether he was a Christian or not. And so, Was- so Jefferson, in his diary, relates uh, the old fox was too cunning for them. He answered every one of their articles, particularly except that, the one that wanted him to, to, to affirm belief in God, that is, which he completely passed over without notice. Right. And so the pot, there's no basis for all the various popular legends, but Washington at prayer at Valley Forge, that uh, saying grace over meals, um, the, you know, the, the cherry, as you mentioned in your opening, the cherry tree, etc. The um, there's there's no indication that he ever took these things seriously or wanted to be involved with them. So why is it that all of a sudden at the end of his life, he's now going to become Catholic and which is the most hated probably religion of all, except possibly Quakerism. And all right, Ryan, I hate to I hate to interrupt it because it sounds like you're about to get to a great point. I'd love to have you come back on with me and finish that up, but we're at, we're actually out of time. Okay. I, I really thank you for coming on. That concludes today's Barrett Briefer on the Crusade Channel, King Size King Radio Size Speakers. I'm Rick Barrett. Grace and peace to all of you.